The Netherlands has made it its business to study every other country in the world. Um, in fact, they've had me there a few times to my amazement. And I've asked them, I don't understand why you think you have much to learn from the U.S. when you do it so well there. And their reply consistently was, well, if we have any success stories, it's because we really do feel like we are students at this and we study practices around the world, including practices that we want to emulate and practices that we want to avoid. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and that is the one and only Professor Peter Norton from the University of Virginia, author of Fighting Traffic and Otanorama, and we are going to be catching up. It's a long one, but it's a good one. So let's get right to it with Professor Peter Norton. Peter Norton, it's such a pleasure to have you back on the Active Towns podcast for the third time. Welcome. John, it's a thrill to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's always wonderful to, to catch up with you. Uh, it seems like we try to do this uh, every couple years, and uh, it's it's bizarre that, you know, I can say that. But partly, you know, it's because you were on board with me early on, way back in, in season one. And uh, in fact, I'm going to pull this up. It's like, yeah, you were like episode 16, season one. And we were early in the coronavirus pandemic, and we spent the time talking about fighting traffic, uh, your first book. And then literally two years uh, later, uh, again, early on, it seems like, uh, well, not that early. I mean, episode 105, season three, but you had a new book to talk about. So we were talking about uh, Atanarama. I suspect we'll talk a little bit about both of those books, um, but we won't linger too much on that because eh, that's that's the past. Uh, but I, I would love to hear from you in terms of like a little update of, of both of the books. And I believe Fighting Traffic is, it's the 10 year anniversary, right? Uh, well, the original hardback came out in 2008. So we're coming okay. up on, on uh G16, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so it, it's probably the soft cover. Um, and, and I noticed that because it's out on my uh, my bookstore. So I've got it in, in the bookstore here. Uh, Fighting Traffic is there. Autonorama is there. Uh, you're mentioned ex uh, extensively in Dark PR by Grant Ennis. And uh, that's out, also out on the, the bookstore. I will provide links in the video description and in the uh, podcast show notes uh, for your books, as well as the Active Towns bookstore, as well as for people who prefer Amazon. I've, I've got links that, that I can put to, to those. But yeah, why don't we do this? Why don't we pause just for a second? I'll turn the floor over to you for a very brief introduction of who the heck Peter Norton is <laughs> and uh, and why we're talking uh, again, having you on the podcast for the third time. So let me turn it over to you, Peter. I'm Peter Norton. I love people-friendly cities, places, and streets. Uh, so I'm also a historian and I try to ask, well, how did we get to a status quo that often isn't friendly to uh, people in, in public places, cities and towns. And so um, that's why I wrote my first book. I wanted to know how we got to where we are today. That was fighting traffic. It was really about the early years of adjusting to automobiles in cities and towns in the U.S. And then in the second book, I was getting concerned about visions of the future where it seemed like the, the effort was, how do we make car dependency work instead of how do we really get the places that we want and the kind of mobility that is healthy and sustainable and affordable for, for everybody? Yeah, so that's me. I love it. I love it. And of course, you are a professor. You are at the University of Virginia. And uh, we'll in include uh, a link to your uh, landing page here. Uh, as well. Yeah, it, it's funny it, when we, we talked about the second, the second book, uh, Atanarama, and we went into, uh, you know, that long history of, you know, the, that, the, the future thinking and we were, oh, we, we're going to have all of this really cool stuff, you know, and we're going to have flying cars and, and all of this. It, it was just, 
it, it's it's amazing when we go back and I'm scrolling through some images here of you know this this concept. There's nothing wrong with like looking into the future and thinking about the future and and trying to do that. But to your point, um, and and you talk about this in the book too, is that we were just like sort of bought into this concept that we're always going to be car dependent versus what you had just mentioned, which is, you know, what about quality of life? And what about, you know, imagining a future where, uh, you, you know, we're not controlled by the machines? Yeah. So I, I want to begin by emphatically agreeing. We need to be thinking about the future. We should be thinking about it every day and we should be asking ourselves what's the best future we can have and what concerned me about, about a lot of those visions that you just scrolled through is that, well, for one thing, they were not coming from the, you know, the people at large, they were coming from the, from the companies with something to sell to us. And uh, I think their vision had a lot to do with how do we sell our products and, and less to do with how do we get the, to the future that we need. But more specifically, what concerned me about those visions of the future is that they seem to be efforts to answer a question like, how do we make car dependency work? And I think we can be asking, how do we make the best future, uh, whether it's car dependent or not? And I don't mean to say that cars have no place in the future, but but surely we can have better choices than we have now. I mean, I think when you you'll reduce our problem to its elemental level, our problem is that we don't have those choices. And I think it would be wonderful if we had many more choices than we usually have today. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we can encourage uh, folks, uh, you know, please go back and, and uh, listen to or watch uh, the two previous episodes. If you haven't already uh, consumed them, uh, they are, are super fun. And we go into more detail, uh, both that first book, Fighting Traffic, as well as the second book, Autonomama. Um, even though it's been a while since we've actually done this, you know, the, the recordings and, and really caught up, you know, visually face to face, right? Like this. And thanks to the internets, um, it seems like we're, we're always in touch on social media. <laughs> you know, I, I, I might be amplifying or, or re tweeting or posting something from you. Uh, I've I, on screen here for the, the listening audience, I've got, uh, uh, your, your, your X slash Twitter uh, page up. And, and that's one of the things that you and I are both very, very engaged and active out on social media, both, uh, you know, for you uh, here, here on X, um, I'm everywhere. <laughs> I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on threads. Uh, I'm on blue sky. You're on blue sky now too. Uh, and so talk a little bit about that side of this, because you're a professor, you're an author, but you're also very much engaged and involved in the, the dialogue, the conversation and the sharing of knowledge uh, out on the interwebs. Talk a little bit about that. I love what social media lets me do that's much harder to do in the usual academic channels. You know, if you publish a paper in academia, it'll take you months to get it out. And I love, I mean, it's instant gratification in one way that I can post something this quickly. I also, I also love reaching a much broader audience. You know, the, this post you've got featured right now begins with my observation that people in the transportation professions, you know, transportation engineers and many planners and so on, often don't get a chance to learn about the history of their field as part of their program. They may learn about it on their own, but they don't take typically courses in, in how we got to the status quo. And I think that we have a lot to learn. We learned many lessons the hard way. And if you've learned a lesson the hard way, uh, you don't want to keep making the same mistake again. And so I think one way I look at what I have to offer and that I, one way in which I use social media is to try to bring to a wide audience the very painful and harder and lessons of the past. And sometimes also some very inspiring things from the past about movements uh, or ideas that we've forgotten so that we have a chance to look at the status quo with some detachment without being immersed in it, you know, with get outside the fishbowl, so to speak, 
and and see things we can do differently. So I, recently I've been posting a lot about pedestrian control and jaywalking, which has a history that I think tells us that we've actually made walking harder. And if we learn how we made walking harder, maybe we can find ways to make walking easier again, because walking used to be the number one mode of everyday practical mobility, and it has some obvious advantages. Yeah, yeah. And and very soon after, you know, the the, the bicycle, you know, became uh, commonplace and, you know, sort of was, was, was uh, adopted in, in mass with the safety bicycle, uh, you know, you extended your reach of being able to walk because you could, you know, travel at a slow speed on a bicycle. And, you know, that was, you know, the technology, the new mobility technology of, of that era. We had streetcars at that time as well. And then soon after, I mean, we're looking at stuff that's, uh, you know, dated from the 1915, 1916 was the earlier post um, that we were looking at. And so we're seeing, and you talk about this in the very first book, Fighting Traffic, is that history. Again, you're a historian. And so you're talking about that history of our streets and our roads and the tensions that took place, uh, you know, as, as we were adopting new mobility modes. And you mentioned it earlier when we were talking about Autonorama, is that there were corporate interests involved too that were very much had stuff they wanted to sell us. And, uh, and then obviously, you know, fast forward to post-World War II, they definitely had stuff they wanted to sell us. They wanted to sell us suburbia. They wanted to sell us not one car, but two cars, maybe more, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it, I think it's really important too, to, to, to focus in on the, the point that and what you've been doing here with jaywalking is winding it back and talking about how something that was never a crime became a crime because they wanted it to become a crime because they wanted to have frictionless uh, mobility and access for motordom and, 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 and the motor vehicles. Yeah, I really like the way you, you framed this as a, a sort of spectrum of alternatives that people once had, like, for example, um, cycling goes along with walking. Uh, the electric street railways were like another way of making walking more practical because they kind of augment walking. You can walk to the, the streetcar and back. I also think it's so important for people to recognize that the the dominance of driving, even in dense cities, was not really a democratic decision. It's not like we as a country sat down together and had a conversation about what kind of mobility we want in cities. Those jaywalking movements that you just scrolled through are from 110 years ago when the vast majority of people couldn't even drive a car, let alone own one, and were getting around on foot, on bikes, and by electric street rail railways. And so it was not a democratic choice. It wasn't science at work. It was it was a political struggle. And, and winners of a political struggle are not always the people who stand for what's best for us all. Yeah, yeah. And just to prove that you, you don't only post, uh, you know, ancient history <laughs> you know, from the historical archives. Uh, here, here's a photo that you uh, posted uh, a few days ago. Uh, and, and it just says priorities. We'll try to describe this for the listening only audience. Uh, it says priorities, Copenhagen, January 4th, 2024. And the photo is credited to uh, Brian Nielsen. And I'll let you describe what this photo is. So we see a photograph of a view of a street in Copenhagen, a broad, long street. And one part of this, this um, mobility zone, if I can call it that, has been very carefully cleared of snow. The rest is under snow. And that part is the bike lane. And I, it looks to me, when I look at this picture, it's as if it's saying something in words. And the words would be something like, we think cycling is a fundamental mode of mobility in Copenhagen. It's as important and maybe even a little more important than anything else. And the fact that they have carefully cleared the snow off of the bike lane 
even though snow is still everywhere else, really tells you something about priorities in Copenhagen and maybe about what we can learn from other countries' examples. Yeah, yeah. And in looking at this image, um, I think I, I recognize where that is. <laughs> so from some of my visits to, to the Copenhagen area and, and riding around on bicycle. And it, I think it's really important, too, because you're, you, 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 you're illustrating in that image that, yes, there are priorities. These are decisions that were made. You mentioned earlier that we didn't really have a vote as to what we wanted. And if we did have a vote, a vote as community members, we probably would have and you mentioned this in your books, we probably would have like said, yeah, we probably like this, this, this image, this, this storyline that you've sold to us. But what we, as, as consumers, community members, we probably didn't have, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. We now know what the negative externalities of modernity really was of motordom. Um, Talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a, an important point. No, we weren't really, quote unquote, given a real choice in it. But had we been given a choice, we might have actually chosen what we got. Well, you know, it's really interesting if I say that the status quo is not really the product of a democratic choice or even consumer preference. Sometimes that gets heard as uh, me saying people wouldn't have had cars at all or, 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 you know, cars would be marginalized. I think the thing that – I think there's a distinction that has to be made. Most people who could afford a car wanted one. And by circa 1920 or so, about half of American families could own a car. So they were very much in demand. Their attractions were very real. What I think – we did not choose, and what I think people actually resisted a lot, is environments where you don't have a practical alternative. If you want to get anywhere, you're going to have to own a car. Now, that situation uh, that we are now as a country in to, an, to a great degree, in other words, very large fraction of Americans really don't have good alternatives to driving. That was not the product of a democratic choice. Um, people loved their street railways. People resisted losing them. They demanded better bus service. People have been demanding bike lanes for, you know, about 130 years. Um, and people have been demanding walkable streets that are safe, safe for children even. Um, one of the most common letters to the editor of a newspaper, which is like the social media of its day, is people saying, my children need safe places to walk and or I need a safe place to walk. And these demands really were persistent. And I don't think that the loss, the failure to deliver on those demands was at all a democratic choice. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of which, uh, you know, one of the, the common themes that comes up in our world of safer streets advocacy and mobility choice is, uh, you know, tapping into the example of the Netherlands and the resistance that took place in the 1970s. Uh, there were multiple things happening in, in the Netherlands during the early 1970s, including uh, the oil embargo and other types of protests that were happening. But one of the protests that were happening was really pushing back against uh, what had transpired post-World War II in the Netherlands, which was the motor vehicle really taking over the space and the increase in fatalities uh, out on the roadways and specifically fatalities of children. And so we, we see in, in screen here a couple of images that, that you have provided. Uh, and I love how you always, you know, take an opportunity to, to remind folks that, yeah, we've been protesting unsafe streets for decades, dating all the way back to, as we were talking about earlier, those early days of the automobile starting to wreak havoc on the streets. Uh, but walk us through these two side-by-side -side images because it's, it, I think there's a, a great lesson here. Well, just like you said, John, the Netherlands, as many people know, sets a really amazing example of, of active towns, really, of sustainable healthful, affordable mobility for people, um, also safe streets where even children can 
navigate their own hometown local streets in relative safety compared to the U.S. And I've been using Dutch examples for a long time in talks and papers, but I was sometimes cautioned, oh, you shouldn't talk about the Netherlands example in the U.S. because it doesn't really apply so well. I mean, for one thing, the Netherlands is a very small country, and I had a I thought a good answer to that criticism was, which is to say, well, it's like it's like two New Jerseys. So if we could if we can make New Jersey work like the Netherlands, then you don't have to worry about how big the U.S. is. But another criticism I got to this example is, well, the Netherlands, there's a tradition there of advocacy, of organizing um, protests, of making uh, demands from citizen groups, and we really don't have that in the U.S. And I partly fell for that. I, I was somewhat cautious uh, about my Dutch examples after that. But I kept finding examples where American people, especially mothers, especially women, as you can see in the picture on the left, were in fact demanding streets that were safe for them, safe for their children, very often at the time that picture on the left was taken, 1953, if there was a car in the family, it was typically just one car. And usually that meant that the husband or father monopolized it. So women were having to negotiate streets on foot and their children were too. And what I kept finding until I realized I was onto something quite enormous was these kinds of protests. They've been almost completely forgotten today, but they were very common. And I, I eventually I, I gave myself a little test or a game. I would give myself the name of a city and then see if I could find, if I really dug, dug around some protests that had happened. And in case after case after case, I, I could. And so really the U.S. was ahead of the Netherlands on making these kinds of demands. It's just that we forgot that history and the Netherlands didn't. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the fact that this is like, as a historian, you're like, I need to dig into this. And then you start finding material and you're just like, OMG, I gotta, I gotta include this now in my slides, in my presentations, out on the internet and sharing this because yeah, I mean, we all kind of have that that bias of thinking we're special. Nobody else is like us, you know, and you can, you know, dot, dot, dot. You can fill in what us is, you know, the city of Austin, Texas, the, you know, you know, whatever. And again, yeah, the, this particular panel on the left is from Philadelphia, July 11th or 12th, 1953. And the panel on the right for the listening audience is a picture of the Kindermort sort of uh, protest movement uh, happening in Amsterdam on October 31st. It looks like it is 1972. And to your point, yes, we have that long history of protesting and increasingly, I'm seeing some protests for safer streets starting to bubble back up again. We're starting to exercise our uh, ability to to push back on the the concept that we, in status quo, have been sort of accepting the death count of you know now it's in upwards of forty thousand people uh, per year who are tragically expiring on the streets in North America. Not to mention the, you know, nearly a million people uh, having serious debilitating injuries uh, on our roadways. So, yeah, it's it's kind of nice to see that we're we're starting to push back a little bit and do some protests not too dissimilar to what we see in these two panels. That's right. And I want to stress that in both cases, including the U.S. case in this in this pair of pictures, we're seeing people who are actually breaking the law. Right. This is one way you can draw attention to a problem is through civil disobedience. We're acquainted with civil disobedience in the civil rights movement. Well, this is civil disobedience to demand streets that are safe for just even just their local residences. It's a very simple demand. Uh, they're saying really the streets belong to all of us, not just to the motorists. Yeah, yeah. And this was actually a topic that uh, Grant Ennis and I talked about in the book Dark PR. Uh, of the fact that, yeah, of, of any of these really bold movements and, and things that happen, you mentioned civil rights, uh, 
the example of women uh, needing, you know, being able to vote. <laughs> you know, these things happen because of a civil disobedience and and protest that took place. And so that's that's part of the challenge in a democracy where things aren't going the way things, you know, quote unquote, should be going properly and ethically, morally, <laughs> you know, you have to speak up. You do. And when the status quo is the problem, you have to speak up in ways that are going to be controversial. When you have a status quo, it's almost by definition, going to be impossible to speak up, except in ways that seem fringe at first to many people who accept the status quo as normal, because we all have status quo bias. We tend to think whatever is existing right now must be the norm. And so these people are really setting an example for us if we think that we need to change the status quo. Yeah. And the, the photo that happens to be on screen right now is from North Hollywood, uh, June 1946, so immediately post-World War II. And uh, a mother is demanding safe streets, safer streets. Exactly. And I, in selecting some pictures of this kind of protest for our conversation, I wanted to show that you could find these in big old cities like Philadelphia, but in also, also in new sprawling suburban areas like North Hollywood. Um, other pictures will show that this is also across social classes. We see working class people, we see well-to-do people, and we see people of different races and ethnicities uh, combining or, or at least in separate protests demanding something better. Although in every case, the large majority um, and sometimes 100% of the adult protesters in the picture are women because of the fact that from their perspective, what they're fighting for is their own and their children's right to safe streets. And given the social norms of the mid 20th century, the responsibility for that falls predominantly on women. And the slide you're showing right now captures something I find extremely important. Uh, we have a, a story we tell ourselves that Americans all adopted the automobile and all adopted driving as the norm by the mid 20th century. And what you've got on the screen right now is a bar chart from 1961 that shows, in fact, that about half of women at that time, 1961, in the U.S., adult women, uh, didn't even have a, a driver's license. Um, and so this story we're getting, oh, basically everyone was driving by the mid-20th century, tells us that by everyone, the word everyone, we were that was really just referring to primarily to men. And it's it shouldn't come as a surprise to us anymore that this is a, a bias woven into any setting where we don't have some diversity of views. We have the dominant group thinking that the norm is whoever they are, not out of maliciousness, but just out of the biases we all have. And so stories that everyone was driving by the mid 20th century really leave out about half of women or really more than half of women if you if you consider that a lot of women who were licensed to drive did not have access to a car every day because the, their husband was likely to be monopolizing it most of the time yeah and of course motordom being the, that group that wants to sell us these things they even started in post world war 2 starting you know to market to women and starting to, you know, encourage that purchase of that uh, additional vehicle. Uh, I, I think they were even, you know, outwardly uh, uh, marketing the station wagon as like the family vehicle, you know, so that you have your freedom. They were very definitely, especially by the 1950s, you see a very definite effort to pitch automobiles to women uh, and to pr promote the idea of the two-car family, to promote the idea that the way you keep your kids safe uh, in getting around town is to actually drive them around town. Now, we it's become so common, so ubiquitous now for parents to drive their children to everyday destinations that we forget that that was a decades-long struggle where the default position was really how do we make it possible for children to navigate their own communities on foot or on bike or by bus, uh, we have 
to to a great extent at least given up on that struggle and i hope that by bringing that struggle back to our attention now we can see that actually the status quo of a couple of generations ago was that children should be able to get around go to a friend's house get to school without depending on a parent driving them so peter we were just talking a little bit about you know some of the historical context and we've used the term motor motordom a few times i know that you talk about this in your book uh, fighting traffic that first book but why don't you give the historical context between uh, of that term motordom well, first, I find it really useful because the alternative is to say something like coalitions of industry groups, including manufacturers, et cetera, and that's really clunky. So I was really delighted to find when I was writing Fighting Traffic this term, it really fell out of use by the 1950s or so, but it originated circa 1900 uh, in newspapers. Uh, and by 1910 or 1920, most newspapers had a Sunday insert, a Sunday section, usually called automobiles. And that Sunday section would have a lot of news about automobile companies. A lot of it was promotional material pr purported or presented as if it were news. And very often the news about what the companies were up to, not just the manufacturers, but also the tire companies, the parts makers and so on, was motordom. And I found it a really nice way to have one word that stands in for this whole team of allies working for a future where you could sell more cars. And a real turning point in this term's history was in the 1920s, the early 1920s, when the American Automobile Association under its president, Thomas Henry, said, you know, we're really going to promote a future uh, where driving is everywhere. And he began calling the American Automobile Association organized motordom. So motordom was a very common word in the, in the newspapers by the 20s, uh, but it fell out of favor uh, in the 40s and 50s. Yeah. And now I use it as as a not so flattering description of <laughs> that coalition. <laughs> I'm pleased to say that after I put it in fighting traffic and started using it, it got picked up by a few people. And I think it's a really apt term. And I don't mind if it has a somewhat negative connotation because some of what motordom has done to promote driving uh, really needs to be revisited. And if that helps us question some of these business agendas, that's, that's to my view, for the best. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're so diplomatic there when you say some of what they have done, because you're right, because, you know, motor vehicles, uh, you know, are so much a part of, of our life. And so it's not all completely negative. That's right. I, I, I think an automobile is a useful tool. It's not an all-purpose tool, though. And uh, as I take a sip of my tea here with my Streets Are For People mug, <laughs> I want to uh, point out that, uh, you know, that streets, you know, were, you know, for people for literally thousands of years, you know, the, the street that place where people came together, uh, social interaction took place, commerce took place, um, you know, really was where society came together. It was also where kids played. Uh, and so what we have on screen now is an image that you provided uh, that talks about how mothers are, are protesting a, a fatal, um, and, and they're blocking a, a fatal play, play street Talk a little bit about this historical context of the fact that that's part of why the parents were coming out, the mothers were coming out to protest, is that this is exactly what happened, you know, a couple decades later in the Netherlands where those mothers were like stopped to kinder mort. Yeah, I mean, to begin with, I think that we could take some pride in this country for being ahead of the Netherlands on these demands. It's just that the Nether in the Netherlands, the demands got a lot more in terms of results, but we were ahead of the Netherlands by a couple of decades in these kinds of demands. I also think that uh, or, or one of my purposes in choosing pictures like this one, uh, it, where we see uh, in a New York uh, Daily News photograph, we can see mothers blocking a street to demand safer streets for children. I'm hoping that a picture like this confronts us with the question, 
how do we respond to the fact that our streets are too dangerous for children? And the reason why I want to confront people with that question is right now, our predominant answer is to, to tell parents, never send your child into a street, never send your child to a destination that's more than a block away. And these mothers are telling us, well, maybe the thing to do is to demand safe streets uh, because nobody in these pictures is blaming the mother or the parent whose child was injured or killed. They are asking their cities for, for streets that are safe for all of the city's residents, including their children and including adults who don't drive. Yeah. In this particular image here, I'm going to pull back just a little bit, make sure we got all the, the wording in here on the description is a great example of, of what we end up seeing in so many of our cities is that infrastructure gets built and it's, it's auto oriented infrastructure. And Oh, by the way, it, you know, people who are outside the motor vehicle, they're an afterthought. And that's exactly what played out here in 1951. That's right. And that's exactly the point I was hoping this picture would convey. So I, I love hearing you express it just, just the way I would have, which is the, authorities in this area near Pittsburgh have put in a bridge with approach roads and there's no sidewalk at all. And we're so used to that in 2024 that we would perhaps hardly notice the omission of the sidewalk. But here we see parents, almost all mothers, as a father, I'm relieved to see there is one father present too, are blocking this access road to a new bridge saying, you're not done with your job. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania until we have sidewalks so that our children can safely cross this bridge and not just motorists. Um, so again, it's a, it's a, my hope is to confront us in 2024 with questions that we sometimes now forget to ask. Questions like, do we have infrastructure when the infrastructure only accommodates cars? Are we, are we not, don't we have more work to do? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we get to other issues that come along with uh, what we were talking about in the beginning, which was jaywalking and how, uh, you know, getting around on foot across your our, our public spaces suddenly becomes illegal if you don't do it just the way that you should. Uh, and 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 then we will end up having other types of things that take place is, you know, as uh, because one of the things that motordom did was was say, oh, well, you can't just cross anywhere. You have to only cross at the the crosswalks and the in in and when we tell you to do it. Uh, and but oftentimes when we look at what our built environment is, there's there's no true safe crossings because the the strodes are so incredibly wide. Or if there are safe crossings, they're so I incredibly inconvenient. They're far apart. It's like a half mile before you get to the next official crossing. So it's interesting. In, in 1952, we see this uh, one, uh, you know, uh, protester. She's she's holding up a sign that says uh, safe crossings for you and I. And so he's just like, oh, wait, way back in 1952, they're also talking about, you know, street lights and safe crossings. It seems like we just haven't really learned from our past experiences. Peter, help us out. <laughs> <laughs> we still see the same debates. We still see the same kinds of demands. I think, though, there is there is an important difference, which is, you know, where is what we would call the mainstream position? And the mainstream position today, I, I fear, is one that says, well, really, uh, we have to accommodate drivers. And if you want to get to a destination safely, you need a car. And if you want your child to get to a destination safely, you need to drive the child there. Um, and so... These pictures are, are reminding us that actually the status quo, the mainstream view, whatever you want to call it, of about 70 years ago was we don't have our job done as a city until we've made sure that everyone, including children, can get where they, they need to go, at least locally, in a, in a safe way. So, yeah, there is continuity. Um, there are these demands today. Families for Safe Streets is setting uh, an amazing example in this kind of advocacy. But um, this is this is really mainstream position uh, of 70 years ago, not not the advocacy position that it is today. Yeah. 
Yeah. And back in, in that era, I mean, when we look at the number of kids who would walk and bike to school uh, back in the day when we're looking, you know, it, we're, we're in the rear view mirror now looking at 70 years ago and we're, but when you looked at, you know, the, the reality, the actual data and statistics is that, you know, part of the reason why the casualty rates were so high with, you know, with children is that children still were walking and biking to school in those times. Our neighborhood schools were still very much a thing. And, uh, and, and, and I think that that's, it, 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 bears repeating the fact that yes, so much has really changed. And we've, we went from seeing, you know, over 50% of kids walking and biking to school to now in, in some, you know, communities, you know, less than 10% doing so. Well, as you said, John, it, it can be much harder, even apart from the dangers of motor vehicles for a child, including a high school kid to get to school on foot or on a bike, the distances alone are daunting. Um, I'm not sure how feasible it is to undo that, but at least we can make a beginning at, at, at trying to. Um, and very often, uh, even when the school is in range, we see parents feeling like their only safe choice is to drive the child there. Yeah, yeah. Now you're a parent. And so you, you've, you've probably experienced this to some level. Talk a little bit about that personal sort of experience of, of raising a child in, in the 21st century where we're at now. Absolutely. So my children were born right around the turn of this century. So they grew up in this car dependent world. I happen to live in a, or next to a city, Charlottesville, that does have a lot of walkable areas within town. Um, but given the geography of where we were living right outside town, we did find we had to drive our children to a lot of places. And I didn't, I was not happy about it, but given the safety imperatives, this is exactly what I felt I, I had to do. Now, once the children were, oh, around 12 or so, uh, if I had to drive one of my kids somewhere, I would drop them off a few blocks away <laughs> to the frustration of my younger one, my older, older son was, was more accommodating of this and just say, well, you know, try walking a few blocks and, and see how that works for you. And of course I began by guiding them a lot about how to cross a street safely. Um, but it, it was my attempt at a compromise, uh, not a compromise I was very happy with though. Yeah. And just to be clear, these protests continued. So this wasn't just a 1940s, 1950s type of thing. This is a photo on screen here in Philadelphia, uh, again, on July 31st uh, in 1968. And mm -hmm. so yeah. these street protests, you know, really continued for some time. Based on the research that you did, when did, when did our protests for safer streets kind of like die down? Was it later in the late seventies and into the 1980s. I can't remember hearing anything of, of major protests at a national level or even at, at a big city level, um, you know, in the nineties, we see them now as we talked about, but yeah. So I was born in the sixties and I don't personally remember protests of this kind. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that as I was growing up in the seventies, they really were becoming rare. Now I, do find evidence of them continuing into the late 70s. But I think a couple of things happened uh, that really put an end to these kinds of demands. One of them is that um, the predominant response to the real danger shifted from how do we make streets safe for children to how do we ensure that every family has has the means to drive their child to and from school. And I think you can actually sort of see this visually in the development of the automobile. Um, the, the minivan uh, really proliferated uh, in the 80s uh, and it was the family friendly car. And it was, if you were a family with a few children, it was a convenient way to sort of provide your own family shuttle service for children. And this is, of course, partly a response to marketing from Motordom that's making sure that uh, it 
helps people frame this problem not as making streets safe for children, but rather as making sure every family has a car they can use for for guiding children. It also, though, I, it's certainly not just due to that. It's also due to parents. And besides the danger of motor vehicles, we see in the 70s and 80s a real rise in the perceived danger from children, uh, from strangers, stranger danger. Naturally, this while this risk is incredibly small, you know, the risk of abduction or something like that is incredibly small, any parent will instantly say, as I would, that even a vanishingly small risk of, of abduction is so uh, horrifying that you will do anything to prevent that. So th those kinds of stories got relatively little press coverage, but then some high profile cases, particularly in the 80s, really convinced people that the responsible parent is the parent who drives their children to destinations and the irresponsible parent is the parent who lets their children be what what we would call a free uh, free range uh, children. Uh, but I'm glad to see that free range child rearing has been making a small recovery because I think this is a vital part of growing up as a child and as developing some self-efficacy as a child. Yeah, yeah. And the, the data is quite clear on that. The data is also quite clear, too, in, in the fact that the rates of abduction, uh, abductions really have never really changed. It's not like we're getting more of them and we had, a, a you know, an, a, an outlandish number of increases of abductions. But what did change was the media coverage of them and making it seem like it's way more prevalent than it is. And the data also st still says that of the abductions that do take place, it's most likely actually not a stranger at all. It's actually somebody who's close to the the, the family. Um, so in, in this particular image that, that is on screen right now is from, to your point, is from the late 1970s. And so it, it did kind of chug along for a while. It's funny too, you mentioned the minivan. I, I chuckle and say, oh yeah, the minivan was just Motordom's, you know, new version of what they were promoting in the 1950s, which was a station wagon. That's right. Um, the minivan is like a station wagon, but much easier to manage child uh, booster seats in or baby seats because the station wagon, you had to bend down and it was awkward to put the seat in and the, the minivan was up higher. It was much easier to put your child safety seat in that. Yeah. We've got the uh, mobility pyramid uh, here on screen. Um, let's talk a little bit about this because I think this is a, a rather insightful point to kind of bring up in, in talking about the way we view mobility and how we get around. Yeah, I mean, if you, th if you think about what our most basic problems in transportation are, uh, I, I think of three in particular. Um, one is traffic congestion, uh, the other is traffic safety, and a third is the greenhouse gas emissions attributable to road transportation, which in the U.S. are quite high in, in the more than 25% range. Um, and what strikes me is that when we look at these incredibly important problems where our lives, our futures, our economies, our well-being are all deeply at stake in intertwined ways, we tend to keep looking for high-tech ways to keep private cars near the top of our priority list. And I wonder why invest all of this effort into somehow hoping that we can somehow make car dependency sustainable, spatially efficient, and safe for the people in the vehicle and for the people outside of the vehicle. If when we look at the, the mobility pyramid the way we would like to see it arranged, and in this, this depiction, walking is at the top, cycling and micromobility is second, and public transit transportation is third. Well, those modes of transportation give us everything. So walking and micromobility and cycling and public transportation are all safe. Uh, I mean, if they're dangerous, it's da they're dangerous because of private cars, not because they're dangerous in themselves. Um, they're all very sustainable. 
uh, especially walking and cycling in terms of you know, greenhouse gas emissions attributable to them. Um, they're all subject to technological improvements, like for example, an electric bicycle can give you an amazing uh, possibilities. And they're also all incredibly um, good in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we just orient our priorities well, it's win, win, win uh, all the way. And I would like to see us shifting our efforts to get more efficient, safer, and more sustainable mobility in ways that align with what you like to talk about in active towns, which is people getting out and moving. Yeah. Yeah. And for the listening audience, yeah, the, this is the mobility pyramid. Uh, the pyramid is actually turned upside down. So uh, the the big thick portion of it, uh, at which is uh, uh, Peter had just mentioned, is is predominantly the largest section of it is uh, walking. And then the, the pointy end of it where we are going to do it much less would be, you know, train or travel by uh, a plane. And so, it, and, and we're, we're, we're recording this on January 11th. Uh, this is going to be uh, going out to you all uh, in the public on the 31st. So 20 days later, it, we're, we're right now hearing every single day about the challenges with the Boeing uh, 737 MAX 9 because it has had a door plug fly out and you know we're gonna before you know it we're gonna have like congressional hearings on this and it's gonna be it's incredibly serious and it is incredibly serious we have a wonderful track record of safe flight and we, we haven't had a fatality in in oh, quite some time from a, a, an airliner crash uh, this was a near miss and having a, a part of the fuselage a, a door plug fly off mid-flight at I think it was 16,000 feet elevation. It wasn't quite at full elevation. Talk a little bit about this context because, you know, what we see is a mobilization of, of, you know, the, the, the powers that be the NTSB is, is mobilized to deal with this. And yet every day, day after day, we have an, a, a mid jet size aircraft, crashing every single day when you look at the fact that somewhere between 100 and 115 people perish on our roadways but it doesn't it's not frontline news it's 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 not leading the news and it maybe should be i think it should be for sure and you know one reason why it's not of course is if, if a plane crashes, you're likely to lose a large number of people at one moment in one place, and that naturally grabs attention, while our deaths on the roads are, are diffused and, and scattered among many much smaller horrors. Um, I, I, almost, I almost called them incidents, but these are horrors for the people involved. If we're serious about safety uh, in aviation, we should be serious about safety where people are actually traveling vastly more often, which is on in our roads. We do respond to safety, but I fear that our responses are, are not, have proved to be not uh, the best uh, that we could, could offer. For example, when a certain part of a roadway has been shown to be a place where crashes happen, very often the response is to design the roadway so that it's more forgiving. And that then means that people uh, will feel safer going faster. And we end up with um, an effect where we're negating some of the safety benefit by faster driving. We see also people driving more and more. So we have a paradox right now where the amount of driving each person is doing is going up and has been going up to the point that even if each mile driven is safer, the total safety benefit is not improving because we're driving more. Another response is to try to use technology to make driving safer. There's certainly a lot of things we can do with technology to make driving safer. But a lot of what gets sold to us as safer driving through technology has more to do, frankly, with selling tech than with making driving safer. Um, and you've just put up a, an ad that was that Cruise put out last spring uh, in a bid to promote their 
robo-taxis in San Francisco with the headline, Humans Are Terrible Drivers. And by implication, the viewer is supposed to conclude, well, therefore, robot cars are likely to be safer. And actually, you know, as we've partly learned over the last few months, this isn't true unless we make the cars so cautious that they're not practical to use. We've, you know, you can have a, a safe robo taxi if it goes frustratingly slow and stops for every everything that has a slight chance of being an obstacle. So there are real limits to what we can do with technology. It can do a lot. We should do everything the tech has to offer. But a lot of the tech that's being sold to us today has to do with driver convenience rather than with actual traffic safety. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you, you alluded to it there, um, you know, the unintended consequences of getting these things out there. They're no longer out there. Cruz has actually pulled their, their vehicles off the road because uh, there were some pretty high profile uh, situations. Uh, fortunately, not massive losses of life, but uh, to your point, um, they were like, they would get confused. They were literally in the middle of an intersection blocking emergency vehicles from getting to where they needed to go. And it got to the point where, yeah, this is rather clear that this technology isn't there yet. Now you talk about this extensively in your book, Otanorama, is that that's been the promise is that technology is going to save us. It's just around the corner. It's just around the corner. It's just around the corner. So I'm going to let you you know, in the context of what we're talking about here, uh, uh, address that uh, briefly. So uh, a lot of people have been asking questions about why so-called autonomous vehicles have been a disappointment now for more than 10 years, maybe up to 20 years, depending on where you start the uh, timeline. What I've been trying to to show is that actually they've been failing us for about 90 years. If you go back to when Motordom was first promising that technology would make foolproof highways. That was the original promise going back to the 1930s. Foolproof highways would eliminate crashes, supposedly. Of course, what they really do is encourage people to drive faster, which means that you may have fewer crashes, but the crashes are worse. And so you're not really getting ahead of the curve that way. Um, so what I've, I'm, I'm sometimes then misunderstood to be saying you know, don't trust technology or are misperceived as a Luddite. What I'm really saying is amazing technology is amazing and it has a lot to offer, but it doesn't make car dependency work. We need to be using technology for what it's best at. And even a robo taxi that is relatively safe is not necessarily affordable. Uh, we've had the illusion of affordable robo taxis because the companies operating them are willing to lose money on them. But if they're going to have a future, they, they have to be somewhat profitable at least. Um, they also don't solve the problem of the fact that they're an energy intensive way to move people and a spatially demanding way to move people. I'd really like to see us looking at, at other possibilities. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we have on screen now uh, just a, a real quick uh, Google search of EV and see what pops up. <laughs> walk us, walk us through what we're, uh, we're 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 glancing at here for the uh, listening only audience. So there's a, there's a term uh, in widespread use. EV stands for electric vehicle, and for some reason, when we and I'm including I'm including myself here, when we hear the word EV, electric vehicle, we tend to picture a car, ordinarily an SUV with a big battery, uh, about, uh, about a thousand pound or more battery in it. And that's an EV or an electric vehicle. And these are supposed to be great things because of the fact that they don't have a internal combustion engine. They don't burn fossil fuels in the engine. And I agree, we need that kind of EV. That kind of EV definitely has a place. But how strange it is that that's the go-to definition in our minds for EV. Uh, and I think the way you can tell that it's the go-to definition is that if you type EV into a Google image search, the images that come up are all SUVs with batteries. Right. So These what guys I've done, right here. Boom. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what I tried to do in that second EV slide is fake a Google image search that I would like to see. So that the image search that you've got up now which shows uh, a pretended 
a result of a Google image search for EVs. It shows you trains, it shows you trams, it shows you streetcars, it shows you electric bicycles, it shows you electric scooters. It even shows you electric trolley buses with the overhead wires. And my point here is to say, look, if we can understand the term EV more inclusively, we have a much bigger toolbox with more tools to choose from, including tools that may be better for the job, depending on the job that we're talking about. So I would like to see us get to a place where a Google image search for EV shows us what I pasted together in this fake Google image search uh, where we have electric bikes and electric trams and so on. Because there's some wonderful results that come from this. So the electric bikes, yes, they have batteries, but those batteries are, you know, much less in mass than the battery it takes to move an SUV. Uh, in an SUV, the battery is moving, uh, let's say, not, but at least 95% of the energy is moving the, the vehicle and not the passenger if there's one passenger. On a bike, more than 50% of the energy is moving the rider. If you have an electric train or an electric tram, you don't even need a battery at all because you can draw your current from wires. And batteries are a terribly difficult thing to produce for lots of reasons that most of your listeners probably know, know some things about. So we can have the electric mobility future we need, and that's sustainable, healthful, affordable, and inclusive, if we broaden our definition of EV. Yeah. And uh, two thoughts come to mind on, on that too, is that in the case of like the electric assist bicycle, it's like, it's a little bit of a boost there for when you need it, but otherwise you are, you know, able to, you know, be, you know, pedaling. And so you're able to contribute. The second thing that comes to mind is I have a, a an addition a request uh, for a different uh, electric mobility vehicle for you to put into this is a Google Google image of a um, uh, a person with a mobility device, like yeah. a person you know needing you know an electric wheelchair type electric scooter, which is one of the things that we end up seeing. We had mentioned earlier, you know what it's like there in the Netherlands these days, and and also um, you have that image uh, from Copenhagen, is that when we see these protected and separated all ages and abilities facilities, mobility facilities that uh, are inherently safer, even streets that are inherently safer for, for people to get around by walking, biking, uh, and using mobility scooters. We see that the disabled uh, individuals who need a, an electric assist, a, an electric mobility device, they're able to use these facilities as well. Um, and, and it's, and it's preferential to the older historic, you know, sidewalks because it's not smooth. And, and so they are able to, you know, have that empowerment, their, their ability to get around is enhanced. And it, that's a, a mind shift for a lot of us in North America, where oftentimes our biggest critics of putting in mobility facilities is from a, a disabled community that feels like the only way they can get around is to drive a car. But there's plenty of people who have uh, mobility issues uh, that also can't drive. And so we need to be able to create more inclusive mobility systems and networks, you know, for people to be really, truly all ages and all abilities. John, I'm so glad you brought that up because for one thing, it, it beautifully illustrates the fact that when you have one person or a team of people who are all from similar backgrounds thinking up ideas together, there are going to be biases that result. And, you know, as an, as a abled person who can walk easily, uh, you know, it was evidently harder for me to recognize that, oh, of course, a, a scooter for a person with limited walking ability is definitely an EV and belongs on EV, any EV result list. But another really important thing about what you had to say here is that right now, robotic vehicles are being sold as the way of that we will make mobility accessible to all, including people who have disabilities. But my, my fear of that messaging is uh, it would be a very long wait till we have the kind of mobility that, that um, people would need coming from robotic vehicles when there's things we can be doing right now to make 
places accessible to people on scooters or other uh, by other means besides driving, especially for people who can't drive uh, because of a disability. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to pull up my uh, my landing page for my website here, um, simply because the image that I chose to use uh, for this is at, at a university. This is at uh, TU Delft in uh, in the Netherlands, and it, it's a great photo. I love this particular image because we have automobile infrastructure uh, in the bottom left. This is where the, the motor vehicles are, are able to travel. Then you have a two-way cycle track um, where we literally see it just packed full of, of students and professors and other people getting to their meaningful destination. This is the morning commute getting to the university. And then on the other side of the trees is the sidewalk, a very wide and generous sidewalk. And so when we hear the term uh, complete streets, the vision that I have a, for a complete street is this. And I think that we, you know, need to be able to be okay with learning from other communities, other societies like the Dutch uh, that are proving that if you build it and it's the right it and you support it with the the software, the policies and and uh, programming uh, to activate the right it, the hardware, uh, magical things can happen just like what we see here in this image. That's right. And the Netherlands has made it its business to study every other country in the world. Um, in fact, they've had me there a few times to my amazement. And I've asked them, I don't understand why you think you have much to learn from the U.S. when you do it so well there. And their reply consistently was, well, if we have any success stories, it's because we really do feel like we are students at this and we study practices around the world, including practices that we want to emulate and practices that we want to avoid. So I would like to see North Americans learning from other countries, uh, just as you say. Yeah, fantastic. Peter, we've come to the end of our discussion, but before we wrap it all up, is there anything that we didn't talk about yet that you want to leave the audience with? I would just like to say that if we're going to have the future that we need and that future generations need, we just had the hottest year on record in 2023. If we're going to respond to that effectively, if we are going to have a healthier population, if we're going to actually reduce the number of people injured and killed in our highways, instead of just making each mile of driving safer, actually make the whole transport system safer. If we're going to be more equitable in our society so that people can afford the mobility that they need for work and for other purposes. If we're going to have those things, we need to put walking, cycling, micromobility, rolling, public transportation, back at the top of that mobility pyramid where they belong and where, in fact, they used to be. And I think we can do it if, if we are not distracted by the promises that technology will magically solve all of our problems. Yeah, yeah. And I did take that opportunity to, to throw onto the screen here the per capita carbon dioxide emissions attributed to uh, road transport uh, circa uh, 2018. I heard the data coming out uh, yesterday that we did see some improvement um, on our carbon dioxide from the transport section. Uh, I, I think it was yesterday that came out. But to your point here is that we're just ridiculously off the scale in terms of our contribution to, uh, you know, global warming in, in this context. And our best opportunity then is to find ways to have a future where we don't have to drive as much, where driving is a choice and not a practical daily necessity for everyone or nearly everyone the way it tends to be now. Yeah. Yeah. And again, this is per capita. So this is per person the, the level of, of emissions that are, that are happening here. Um, 
talk a little bit about as a closing uh, thing, the, this slide and because you, in your closing statement there, you, you, you mixed them both. You talked about the fatalities, but you also talked about uh, the, the, the challenge of, of global warming. So I don't want to not give this particular slide from the National Academies of Sciences a go. So right now the USA has a very bad traffic safety record relative to other high income countries. It's at the bottom of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development countries. Those are, you know, that's a nice proxy for high income countries. And that's not for lack of trying. It's because what we try to do in response to traffic dangers is, has not been working. What we've tried to do in response to traffic dangers predominantly is to build road infrastructure that's more forgiving of, of driving. And in so doing, we encourage people to drive faster. And not only that, we actually kind of compel people to drive long distances and drive faster because we don't have enough affordable housing at the destinations where people need to be. And so instead, people have to live far from work in order to have the affordable housing that they need. And I think this graph captures this problem beautifully because the red bar, which shows you a declining fatality rate, that is the number of deaths per million miles traveled, does in fact have a encouraging trend, although that flattens out in recent years. But it is negated by the fact uh, and the reason the fatality numbers stay so high is not just due to population growth, it's due to the fact that people have been driving a little more every year because we have engineered an environment for them in which driving is a practical necessity for many people and, which, and in which driving more uh, and longer distances every day is often a practical necessity of just meeting the daily needs of living. I think we can f have a better result if we strive to have a future where driving is less necessary uh, every day for most people. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Peter, thank you so much. It's uh, always a joy having you on uh, you know, the podcast. Uh, is there any, the very, very last thing, is there anything happening in the future, a new book or anything that we need to be uh, keeping a, a, an eye out for? I've always got a lot of little projects going at the moment, uh, nothing like a book, but um, uh, yeah, nothing I will feel, nothing I can sort of single out to call your attention to. Okay. Well, you know what to do because when you do have a book that you want to get <laughs> okay. out or a report that you want to talk about, you hit me up because I'd love to have you back on. All You're right. one of my favorite guests ever, obviously the third time. Uh, again, <laughs> Peter, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. John, it's been a great pleasure. It's a thrill to be with you. Thank you for having me. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Professor Peter Norton. And if you did, please hey, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider supporting my efforts out on Patreon, buy me a coffee, YouTube, super thanks right down below, as well as buying things from the Active Town store. I've uh, got some really cool stuff out there, including brand new coffee mugs, streets for people in black, also in white. As always, every little bit adds up and is much appreciated. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>